Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to Servant of Christ Ministries. Hope and pray you're doing well. Uh, last time we answered the question on what Jesus really meant when he said, judge not, lest ye be judged. Now, if you're interested in the answer to that question, please click the link to the playlist below and select episode 16. But in today's study, we're going to continue in Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 12, where Jesus continues the Sermon on the Mount by talking about subjects such as ask, seek, knock, uh, how can you being evil still do good? And then, of course, he highlights the golden rule that so many people adopt today. So first thing I want to do before we jump right into the content is I want to welcome some of you new viewers who may be watching Servant of Christ Ministries for the first time. Uh, on this channel, my goal is to just help you understand the Bible just a little bit better so you can draw closer to God in the right way and not be uh, taught or give into false doctrines and false teachings. Now, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. Uh, I would ask that you would probably leave comments that are more uh, geared toward what the teaching is going to be on today, just because I think that your questions and your comments do help in the teaching process. Uh, so it's not just me up here teaching. When you ask a question, you're probably asking questions that most people may be a little bit afraid to ask themselves. So please leave your comments and questions below pertaining to this topic. So what we're going to do is we're going to jump right in uh, to today's study and let's go to Matthew chapter 7 verses 7 to 8. It says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be opened. So the question here, and the first thing, you, as you can see, that I have highlighted is to ask, right? What are we asking for? But more importantly, what is the it that will be given to us? Now, I know a lot of people out there uh, might think, and you probably have heard these verses taken out of context, and people would say, well, if you just ask the Lord for what you want, you will get what you want, right? Is the it here that we should be asking for? Is it our desires, our wishes, our dreams? Is the it here kind of leading towards some kind of law of attraction? Now, some will quote the passage like this to say that we can ask God for anything we want and he will give it to us. But in honesty, what is the it? Let's pay, let's go back to it. And this is why context is so important. So he says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. I think one thing that we should do is go back a little bit to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. Uh, let me uh, pull that up for you guys. It says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be provided for you. Now, when I talked about this last time, and this is why context is important, the seeking first, right? Well, so let me connect them for you. It says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. But here in Matthew 6 and 33, the context is seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's the goal. So let me kind of walk you through this. Everything pertaining to his kingdom, not ours. That's what seeking first the kingdom is. That means everything we do in our life right, is to build up that kingdom, right? In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 21, uh, he talks about for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So one of the things I want you to grasp is this idea that us seeking and knocking and looking for these things are not our own desires. Now, if you are in Christ, your desire will be, of course, uh, let me go back to it, will be first to seek his kingdom and his righteousness. Uh, now, his righteousness, there's a couple of ways we can kind of take that portion. Uh, so number one, his righteousness could be seeking his righteousness for salvation, but also seeking his righteousness in doing the things that he asks us to do as Christians and doing right, being just and not treating people unjustly. Now, we'll get into the unjust treatment a little bit later in detail, but I just wanted to highlight that portion for you. Okay, but let's go back. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find out with that knowledge in our mind. Let's see if this makes a little bit more sense. Right. Ask for him, for his kingdom and his righteousness, and that will be given to you. Seek his kingdom and his righteousness and you will find it. Knock and the door will be open. So knocking is this idea of you wanting to come in to Christ. It says for everyone who asks receives. Now, with the context given, now verse 8 makes a lot more sense than a lot of those prosperity preachers like to say. For everyone who asks for his kingdom and his righteousness receives it. And the one who seeks his kingdom and his righteousness will find it. And the one who knocks on the door, that door will be open to his kingdom and his righteousness. So 
Does it now make sense when he says, ask, seek, and knock? And if you're thinking about his kingdom and his righteousness, of course, he guarantees that he will give it to you. This is not something God is trying to hold back. And of course, you could imagine some of the people uh, who are living under the persecution of the Romans, who are in uh, dire straits, are kind of suffering right now. And he's telling you, hey, listen, there is a way out of this, but the only way is going to be through me, through Christ. OK, so let's continue on with the passage. Uh John chapter 10, verses 7 through 10, I think is an important picture for us to grasp. And then I'm going to show you an illustration after we kind of walk through this verse, because I think it gives us a good picture of who Jesus is in this scenario of asking, seeking and knocking. All right. So John chapter 10, verses 7 through 10 states, Jesus said again, truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the gate. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. A thief comes only to steal, kill and destroy. I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. So let me go to the first blue portion here in the passage. Uh, I am the gate for the sheep. And I want to give you show you guys an illustration here. So in ancient Israel, in the ancient Near East and even some places today, uh, build their sheep pen with rock. Some build it in a circular form. I've seen some photos of that. And some build it in this square or rectangular pattern. But the thing I want you to focus on more than anything is that Jesus is the gate, right? He is, for example, this shepherd and the gate. And there are a couple of things I want to highlight here. Number one, when it comes to gates, gates are protective. They are ways in and out. They are pathways as well. So when Jesus says, I am the gate, let me go back to the passage. He says, I am the gate for the sheep. So he is the path, right? Jesus has said this in many scriptures. The most famous one, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one enters into, no one comes to the Father except through me. When you look at that in this illustration here, you find that there's no way to enter in to where the sheep are or even enter or to come out unless you're going through the gate, unless you're going through the sheep. And of course, this kind of uh, shows you this narrow way, right? It says broad is the gate that leads to destruction, but narrow is that gate that leads to righteousness, to leads to God. Again, that shepherd is the gatekeeper and he protects the sheep. Now, some people may view this as a little bit controlling. Why are the sheep in that pen? Well, for protection. As a matter of fact, uh, when you look at the times of the ancient Near East, there will be a lot of wolves that would come and try to attack the sheep. And the only way to get through to the sheep is to go through the shepherd. Now, here's uh, something I definitely want you to think about, right? All who, ki who came before me are thieves, right? What does that represent for us today, at least understanding in the context of what he's teaching? Well, he's t dealing specifically with false teachers and individuals who would claim to be the Messiah. All right. Let me go back to the passage so we can see that clearly. So all who came, uh, verse seven, and Jesus said again, truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. So he's the one that protects and the path to freedom and righteousness and true peace. Verse eight, all who came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep didn't listen to them. So those who are truly followers of Jesus didn't listen to these false teachers and these quote unquote false messiahs. Verse nine, I am the gate. If anyone enters by me, check this out. He will be saved. Didn't the scripture talk about that just a little bit earlier? Let me uh, go back to it. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be provided for you. Of course, in the context, he's talking about uh, some of the basic necessities, but also salvation right? His righteousness is his salvation. So when you come here in, in John chapter 10 and verse 9, I am the gate. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. This is not, he may be saved. It's possible. This is, he will be saved. So if you enter into Christ and you want God and you want the father and you come, you know, before God in, in a humble attitude and you lower yourself before him and you acknowledge him as King and Lord, He's not going to now be this ruling king that just mistreats you. As a matter of fact, uh, when you look at the passage, he, he claims to give you something that you're already seeking. Every single one of us are seeking this thing, but we don't know what it is. There's this inner drive for this ultimate peace, right? He says he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture, right? Uh, number ver verse 10, a thief comes only to steal, kill and destroy. So here's a little play on the false teacher aspect as well. When it comes to the Messiah, when it comes to Jesus, he doesn't need anything from you. 
He's bringing riches. He's bringing a wonderful life to you. He's giving you freedom and pasture and peace. False teachers always want something from you, whether it be money, whether it be um, uh, just notoriety, fame. They, they're just trying to draw things from you. And Jesus is completely the opposite. So the, ver the last portion of verse 10 that I have highlighted says, I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. So I want to talk a little bit about this because I think it's important for us to grasp concepts uh, that lead us to understand what God is saying here. Now, most people, most false teachers will tell you that this passage about having the abundant life, right? I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance are going to refer to the life that we currently live in. And so what does that do to people who are really seeking Christ, but maybe going through hardships? The first thing they're going to think is that their hardships are a sign that God doesn't love them. I'm here to tell you that your hardships may be a sign that your priorities are straight and that you're investing in the right kingdom, right? Us as Christians, uh, and of course, uh, Jesus, while he's walking through the Sermon on the Mount, has been pointing forward the whole time. He hasn't been pointing to this life as something to obtain uh, a perfect uh, holiness and peace. He's saying in the kingdom, I'm going to reward you in the kingdom. You will have eternal life in the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom. Everything is a future context and eternal perspective. But many false teachers are going to take this and isolate it to now. So, again, when people are suffering, what are they going to think? Well, God doesn't love me. God doesn't think that I have. Well, God doesn't think that I'm good enough to be blessed when the blessings are the promises to come, not necessarily the here and the now. Now. Am I saying that God doesn't bless people here and now? Absolutely, he does. But that's not the promise. That's just a blessing, right? The promise is eternal life. The promise is, and uh, again, eternal life and a kingdom in the future. I could talk about this all day, but let me not spend too much time on this. Um, a one person that I would advise that you think about when it comes to understanding an eternal perspective is John the Baptist. Now, anybody who looks at John the Baptist's life and thinks that he wasn't blessed by God is a maniac. Now, here's what here's what I mean. Most people today who are false teachers and preachers or prosperity gospel would focus their their uh, would focus and say, look at John the Baptist. He wasn't blessed. Now, of course, they wouldn't say that to you, but they may look at somebody now who is not necessarily uh, uh, rich or well dressed. But when we look at John the Baptist's life, think about how he looked. He was dressed in camel's hair. He was living around in the in the outskirts of Jerusalem and doing all kinds of things. Uh, he was eating locusts and wild honey. Anybody would look at him and say, wow, the Lord doesn't love him, man. Look, he, he's here. He's here preaching the word of God and he's living that kind of life. But in all honesty, his priorities were straight because where do you think he is now? I believe he's in the presence of God. I believe he's not suffering anymore. His his life is perfect for eternity all the way to, uh, to the future, right? There's no suffering. There's no pain. There's no difficulty. There's no more locusts and wild honey. There's no more uh, camel hair for clothing. All those things were temporary. And I just want to encourage you out there, those who are seeking Christ and maybe suffering or maybe going through hardships. I just want you to know that if you put Christ first, your goal is eternity. It's not right now in this temporary life. And, you know, there are a lot of scriptures out there. Psalm 73 is probably one of my favorites to kind of place us right back uh, with an eternal perspective. But let's go on before I start talking about all, uh, all kinds of other things. OK, let's go to the next portion. Matthew chapter seven, verses nine through ten. Who among you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake. Now, Jesus here is using an analogy to kind of frame the minds of his listeners. And he is using polarizing, you know, um, ideas here. So when he says, who among you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone or asks for a fish, will give him a snake. Right. The assumed answer to this question is none of us would. Right. But Jesus sets them up so that they see something quite special. And what Jesus says next is very profound. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 11 states, If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So what is he saying here? Well, hey, listen, if you who are evil, and the evil that he's talking about here is not saying that these individuals are worthless, but what it means is that if you who are of lesser moral character than God, 
could do good to your children, how much more do you think me or God here is going to give good gifts to his children? Right. A lot of the time we think along the lines of, hey, we're so righteous. We're so good. We do the right thing. How come God people are always accusing God? But then we look at our lives and we'll point to people on the earth and say, wow, that's a good man. Look how great he is. Look how he takes care of his children. But then look at God as if it's the opposite. Like if you who are evil, look at the world uh, we live in. There are individuals who do wicked things, who hurt people. If even those individuals to some degree are going to do good to their children, how much more do you think God is going to do? And again, the question we should be asking is, what should be... Uh, What should we be asking for? Right. It says, if you then who are evil or of lesser moral character, who are sinners, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your father, who is of perfect character in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? Now, again, is this saying that you're supposed to be asking for your own wealth, your desires, your your inner inner heart desires? Is that what it's talking about? No. Because as we know from the context, the give the good gifts that he's giving us is eternal life, is his righteousness, is himself. And if we ask God for that, he is faithful and just to give us those things. Right. So, again, it's all about having the eternal perspective of what really matters in this life. This is a supernatural wealth transfer. Right. This is the transfer that we're looking for. We're looking to ask God for him and we're looking to get him as opposed to what false teachers might tell you is you ask God for riches and he will give it to you. And again, this law of attraction thing has been kind of creeping its way into the church, if not has found itself in the church and that we can just speak what we want. We have the power to ask and, you know, all kinds of scriptures are misquoted. But when you look at the context, what is he talking about here? He's talking about himself. We should ask for his kingdom and his righteousness. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12 and uh, get this together. It says, therefore, so now we're going to enter another aspect. So we've talked a lot about um, uh, looking, seeking him, doing what he asks, seeking his righteousness. Well, here's a way to also kind of get, in a sense, that kingdom here on earth, that kind of kingdom mentality that let's live as if we live in God's kingdom. He says, therefore, what, whatever you want others to do for you, do also the same for them. For this is the law and the prophets. So, of course, this is the love your neighbor aspect as you would love yourself. And God uses us to fulfill the needs. Uh, We are the hands and feet of Christ. So when we think about that passage and um, let me just read it one more time. Therefore, whatever you want others to do for you, do also the same for them. For this is the law and the prophets. So here Jesus is speaking directly about the passage in a way that helps us to convey like what really matters. So the first portion of the Sermon on the Mount of this portion here, we've been talking about seeking God and his righteousness to seek him. He's the the the, um, the apple of our eye or should be the apple of our eye. Now, how do we then fulfill that kind of righteousness? Well, by doing just and good to others, right? Giving a fair wage taking care of the widows and the orphans, making sure that we are the hands and feet of Christ. Okay. But you may be asking, okay, I get that. But what is our ultimate, what what should we be ultimately looking for? Well, recently I've been walking through the minor prophets. And of course, I have just finished Micah just a little while ago. And it's beautiful how the Lord will kind of guide and teach you and things will stand out. Uh, Let's go to Micah chapter six and verse eight for our last scripture, as I think it will be very beneficial for you to see. It says, mankind, he has told each of you what is good and what it is the Lord requires of you to act justly, to love faithfulness and to walk humbly with your God. Now, here's what I find interesting and I think uh, is very important. When you're reading the book of Micah, and I do suggest that you go read the book of Micah, and if you're watching this, go read it right now, because it, you're going to see so much, so many tie-ins. There may be some prophecies in there or, or some proclamations you may not grasp at first, but when you look at the grand scheme of it, right, he was rebuking Israel for not loving their neighbors, right, being unjust in judgment, uh, giving these sacrifices without really wanting change. And so what does God want for us? Uh, what is good? What is it that the Lord requires of us? He says to act justly. Now, we will think about that and we might think it along the lines of, hey, I just need to act right. But it says here to act justly. In other words, to treat people right. 
right? Just to treat them right. Like, for example, when it comes to judgment, right? As maybe a judge or even a pastor or elder or teacher, you want to treat people with, number one, with respect as if, and, and, and you know, that's what they are, the image bearers of God. Right. These are individuals who are made to reflect Jesus, to reflect God. And you should treat his children with respect and dignity. You should not be a false teacher. Right. Because there were false teachers during the time of Micah. And, and here's a crazy scenario, because we talked about it a little bit during uh, this lesson. There were individuals in the book of Micah who were preaching prophecies to people and telling them what their itching ears wanted to hear. And then they would say if they and then they would require money of the people in order to keep preaching these good things. And when the people weren't preaching good, well, when the people weren't giving money, then they would preach bad prophecies and basically condemn them or make them feel condemned. And then they said, hey, if you want to listen to better prophecies and we're getting these messages from God, if you want to hear from him again, you got to make sure you give us your money. And what did they do? They gave the money, right? Because they wanted to hear good things. Now, does that sound like something that happens today? Are individuals, like for example, uh, when it comes to like false giving or the preachers trying to get money from people, uh, think about how they preach, right? If they if they know you're going to give, they're going to preach all these good things. Oh, you're, you're the head, not the tail. You're never going to suffer. The Lord wants you to have an abundant life. And this is what people want to hear. So they give money in hopes to obtain that kind of life. But what happens when they don't give money? What happens when the pastor can't buy his uh, Bentley or anything like that? Then all of a sudden you guys are he'll kind of come down on the people. You guys don't trust God. You haven't given that offering, so forth and so on. So the reason I say all that, because when it comes to the passage, what is it that the Lord is requiring of us, of you and I to act justly, to love faithfulness, right? Faithfulness being faithfulness to God, to being faithful to people, trustworthy, right? And then it says to walk humbly with your God. Now, this is something that the children of Israel were guilty of, right? They didn't walk humbly with God, right? They took the laws of God and they made them burdens on people. They stressed people out. They broke them down, right? So that's what uh, the passage here uh, is about. And hopefully you got some uh, wisdom from this. So let me wrap it up. In summary, when we ask and we seek and we knock, we should be searching for God and looking forward to his kingdom and not our own. And if you think you're a faithful parent out there, then know that God is much more faithful than you could ever be. You should trust him when he says despite and, and you should trust him despite the circumstance. Right. That's what we talked about here and that he's going to give you the more abundant life later. Right. That's the goal. Uh, many of the prophets looked forward to the coming of the Messiah. They looked forward to seeing David's kingdom in a sense. Uh, they looked forward to these things and they didn't see them. But many of them who trusted God and read Hebrews 11 died even trusting that. They didn't see it, but they still trusted God. So listen, your life, you're going to have difficult circumstances. You're going to have trying times. And you may not see deliverance in that sense. I'm not talking about salvation, but deliverance from your circumstances until the kingdom. Are you going to trust God despite your circumstances? Are you going to live your best life later or are you going to try to live your best life now? Your best life now will never be, no matter how many riches, if, if you won the lotto, right, and you had a billion dollars, that still pales in comparison to what the Lord has promised you. So don't seek the best life now. Seek your best life later. All right. So next time, what are we going to be talking about? Uh, as we continue the Sermon on the Mount series, we're going to be uh, on the next lesson. We're going to focus on the narrow gate and what that means. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit more about false prophets and how to be on guard. And of course, we're going to be dealing with that scary scripture that says, I never knew you depart from me, you workers of iniquity and what that really means. Well, hopefully this uh, lesson of the Sermon on the Mount series has been a blessing to you. If it has, please feel free to share, like and subscribe to the channel. And that's it. God bless. And uh, make sure you guys read his word so that you may know the one true God and find true peace in him and his kingdom. Until next time, God bless and I love you all. Peace.